Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Goldman Properties, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Triangle Equities, The Wickoff Group, Urban American. What is a serial entrepreneur? A serial entrepreneur is a kid who grew up in the Bronx, who went to Bronx Science, who then went to City College and won the Ernst & Young Master Entrepreneur. This is a kid from the Bronx. Today, this kid from the Bronx is my guest. It's Bert Brodsky. Thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome, Michael. So, Bert, you were born in the Bronx. You told me your dad came over when he was seven years of age. What did he do? Well, uh, my grandfather put everybody to work when they got out of yeshiva, about 14, 15. The first job that I remember him telling me about was he worked in a hat store, uh, selling hats. And then he got into the textile sales. Then he went into the peace goods. He was a peace goods salesman and uh, worked for a company for maybe 25 years. So you were born in the Bronx, and you told me it was in the apartment uh, on Bronx Park East? Yep. Uh, in Bronx Park East, it was your mother, your father, your brother, and your grandmother in the... And me. And you. In the one-bedroom apartment. one-bedroom apartment. But I was lucky. I had my own little room because I had the kitchen. You know, in those days, you had like a kitchen, like a galley kitchen connected to like a kitchenette where you could eat. That little kitchenette, which had a window, was my bedroom. My brother... He slept in the living room with my grandmother. You told me you started, you had jobs and delivery work, and then the, the, the really thing when you were going to high school, where you truly learned to be an entrepreneur, is you got a job in the, uh, the dry cleaning store. That I, I actually had the job in junior high school as a, deliver, as a boy who just was a, matched up the garments, the pants with the jackets, and the, what happened was uh, I stayed there, I learned, and my boss had a girlfriend. He was married at the time. But as soon as I showed up, he ran away with the girlfriend. So he left me at the cleaning store. And, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. What happens is someone comes in. Please, sir, can I get my pants pressed? I, I need them pressed right now. It's just me. So I learned to be a presser. And somebody came in. Could you please fix my cuffs? I, I needed a little shorter, please. I became a tailor. So, and I became a businessman. Now, the interesting situation is you went to public school and then you got into Bronx High School. How come you went to Bronx Science? I didn't want to go. I wanted to go to my, with my friends to uh, Christopher Columbus High School. But my mother said, if you made science, you're going to science. But you know what's interesting? So you, gra you graduate Bronx science, science, you're still in the dry cleaning store, and your mother, being a, a good Jewish mother, says, Bert, you're going to be a doctor. 
So what happens the th first three semesters, which wasn't in our discussion originally, but I found it in one of my researching. That's true. I, I, um, I went to City College uptown. And my first semester at City College, I took the same courses. I took my last year at Bronx Science, and I failed. I, I, now looking back, I could be a, psych a psychiatrist and figure out why. At the time, I, I didn't want to be a doctor. My whole life, I wanted to be a businessman. So the first semester, I, I didn't do well, and you automatically get readmitted to the school. The second semester, I didn't do well, and they, if you apply, they readmit you. And then the third semester, they said, we're sorry, Mr. Brodsky. So, so you meet this dean who has later on helps you uh, later on in your life, and you even made it nicer when you endowed a scholarship in his honor. It uh, wasn't, it was, right, it wasn't exactly a chance meeting. My mother finally said to me, it'd be a shanda. It'd be a shame. I couldn't tell the neighbors that my son flunked out of college. Anything you want to be, go be. Just go to college. So with my dispensation that I don't have to study to be a doctor, I went to Great Hall at City College. I hunted down the dean of uh, students, and I begged him to let me back. And I told him the story, that I was a good student in high school. I didn't want to be a doctor. My mother wanted me to be a doctor. And now I am free to do what I want to do. I want to study uh, finance, account, uh, economics, and accounting. And just give me one more chance. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Please, I beg you. And he said, I don't know why. I'll give you one more chance, but don't even come back to me if you don't succeed. And that's all I needed. Now, it's, it's very interesting because, so you graduated uh, City in 1964. You get into what we would call the, the Jewish soldiers. Uh, many of us went to the Army Reserve. Right. Uh, you were Fort Totten over there. Then you get a job in the finance. But the dean, the same dean, is instrumental in helping you get this job. Tell him. He got me an interview with a company called Worth Financial, which was a uh, uh, commercial finance company. He did receivable financing, inventory financing. And I interviewed, I'll, I'll not forget it, uh, they were going to pay me $5,100 a year. Gray Advertising offered me $5,200. But the finance business was really what I loved because it was business. So they, they uh, took me and, and uh, we had lunch at, uh, at the time was uh, um, Manny Wolf's. And, uh, the old, which is now Smith & Now it's Smith & I, I couldn't get over the steak and the, the I mean, you sides. The drugs. You never saw I, never, I couldn't believe they took me to lunch. And I agreed to take the job. And it was a, a great opportunity for me because I learned that industry. And then what happened was, at first I was a very junior person. And my boss ended up leaving to go work for one of our clients. And uh, the, the president of the company said, Bert, just sit in that seat and keep everything under control until we can replace uh, the person who left. I read everything I could learn about uh, um, counselable financing, inventory financing, the difference between factory, and he never replaced that person. I took the job. So what happens after? I stayed in that job for five years. I always wanted to be in business myself, and my boss in that business said, Bert, with your ethic, you should really work for yourself. And I had a cousin who had a small billing business in New Jersey, and he's, medical billing. Medical billing. We bill for, they were billing for hospital-based physicians, mostly anesthesiologists. And he said, I'm in New Jersey. Why don't you do New York? I said, you know, this could work. I don't have a lot of capital, but didn't require it. You needed a t telephone and a desk. So he uh, introduced me to the business, and uh, I started that business June 1970. Was the, uh, and Muriel was your bookkeeper, right? The Muriel came in as a bookkeeper. And she was my bookkeeper until uh, um, we got big enough and then we had children. And she's a, she was also a substitute school teacher. At the time, she was a school teacher. Uh, this is National Medical. Yeah, this was originally called Medical Arts Office Services. And in the... Cousin was Jerry something. Jerry uh, Kadish. Kadish. Right. Jerry Kadish, right. So uh, when I had 11 secretaries typing bills... And every time you made a payment, they had to retype the same bill. I said, there had to be a better way. Well, the first step was the Selectric typewriter. 
which was like a little memory Right, because you had the, the, the little, so you could, you had, had the, the, like the stencil over there to take out the, the changes. You could, right. You could just, then you could just add certain things. But then I went to uh, New York Tech, and I met a graduate student who was running New York Tech's Xerox Sigma 9 computer, which, believe it or not, Xerox made at the time. I said, can't you create a program where you start with an opening balance, and you just add the, the new billings and subtract the payments and come to a closing balance? And can't you just send out a bill automatically? And we developed the, the, really the first system for hospital-based physicians because at the time, they thought it, it didn't make sense to put all the information in about a patient. It's a one-encounter anesthesia, generally. And then you pay, the bill gets paid, and it all gets purged out. But we were able to do it successfully. Now, when did you get involved with the insurance business and the, you, you took care of the doctors? You did all of this. Well, I skipped a little piece. In 1968, um, the finance the company got bought by a company called Stoner Eastwood which was Michael Swerdlow, who became a real right. estate person, and Sam Selden. And they put me in the insurance business. They said, Bert, we want you to liquidate out the receivables in the, in, the, in the finance business, but be an insurance agent. So I got my license, and I became an insurance agent. And which was very, you know, relationship, because the insurance, you also became the insurance, you were taking care of the leasing for many of the physicians later on. When I you started well, with the anesthesiologists. What happened was, once I got the client, and I convinced them that they Cradle were... Cradle to grave, as we would say. Exactly. Well, it was, it's a really continuum of care. <laughs> so um, what would happen is, I get the client. Now, if you were making $125,000 a year, now I take over your, basically your practice, and you're making $200,000 a year, I could do nothing wrong. So when I say to you, Michael, don't you want, a, you want a Cadillac? Don't worry about the Cadillac. We'll get you the Cadillac. We'll take it out of the money we collect for you. Because you're only making 120, you really got to have a pension plan because now doctors could incorporate. You probably didn't know right, that. Right, they weren't the PC. Right, right. so I'm going to get you a, a fixed benefit pension plan, and we're gonna, you're going to take 120000 in salary, and we're going to put away $50,000 a year, but we ought to fund it with insurance because that's safe. It's a good way to fund it. It's a good tax benefit. So I became the insurance salesman. I'm in the car leasing business. But the insurance was interesting because I, I sold for Union Mutual. I, I became the top producer in the country. And they had a great product. They had a great disability product, right. I remember, for doctors. That's correct. And what happened was, by being uh, uh, number one in the country, everybody thought I was this great insurance salesman. But I, I didn't do that for a living. My real business was the medical billing. And my wife would hate when I would say, they'd ask me, well, how did you prospect? How did you get the client? How did you convince the client to buy the insurance? And I try to explain, but most insurance people didn't get it. But I did very, very well with it. For five years, I was the top five. I was number one, either once or twice. And I didn't have to sell a lot of policies. Now, so then you go in, when, when Sand Data started? Sand Data started after I sold my medical billing business to a, a large public company in California at the time called ITEL Corporation. And they were in the computer business. So they said, Bert, for two years, you'll process the billing business, but then we're going to do it ourselves. So I had all these computers. So for two years, I knew I had revenue to keep in business. But then I had to find something else to do with that data center. And then you get into the prescription business. First, we got into the home care business. Right. We started to build, uh, 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 we created a program with the city of New York, which was a great program. What it was, if you took a welfare recipient, instead of that welfare recipient who, as an example, had his hip replaced, rather than keep him in the hospital till the, til they were mobile and pay $500 a day, this is Medicaid paying, why don't you let him be in his house, which he'd prefer, take another Medicaid recipient who's on welfare, give them $100 a day, and let them stay in the, and just be with the person who's incapacitated. And it was a wonderfully successful program. And... Last year, that program had 40,000 people in it, and the city paid over $1,600,000,000 in that program. But it was well worth it, because the choice was hospital, skilled nursing. You were better off in your own home. Your own home. And everybody would rather be in their own now, home. Now, during this period of time, you went into prescription, you went into the computer. But I think one very interesting business that people, you know, 
very uh, that you were instrumental in was Fonar. Oh, that was interesting. When, when Fonar, I s- which was the really the opening of the open MRI, the regular yeah, MRI, regular. before open. What happened was be- because I, uh, I I was bought by a very big public company. It was like IBM going into a new field. It made the newspapers, and uh, I had a cousin who was a radiologist. And between my cousin, who was a radiologist, and the newspapers, I had someone called uh, John Demadian, who was a, a radiologist and inventor, called me up, said, would I look at an invention he had? I was young. I looked at everything. So I see this invention, and he says, put your arm in this machine. I put my arm in the machine, and he shows me a uh, computer screen and says, see, your arm is perfectly normal. To me, it didn't look like anything. I didn't understand it. He said, we can look in your skull and see if you have a tumor. Now, right now, people have to be operated on. This new machine is the next in technology in, in radiological uh, exams. So I couldn't tell. So I had a cousin who was a radiologist. We shipped the machine to Cleveland. He did the research on the machine and said, yes, that is the next in radiology. And we raised money and moved him to Melville, Long Island. And that company at first was Rainex, became Fonar. And Ray Demadian was the... Uh, Inventor. The guy who created the MRI. Right. The problem was he wanted the Nobel Prize. I just was there for the economics. and the. We ended up separating. Uh, I sold out my shares and did great. He never made money making that machine. As I was saying before, on a serial entrepreneur, you also got involved with real estate. I mean, one of the first real estate build, uh, endeavors was the building where you had uh, medical arts. That was my very first building. I could have rented space for $2 a foot in some other building or buy this four-store taxpayer that uh, the first mortgage, the second mortgage, and the note to the broker would cost me $2 a foot. So I took one store for myself. I rented the other three stores. Then I took two stores, three stores, four stores. And by, before I moved into the my consolidated building, we had about 11 different locations in Port Washington from uh, storefronts to shopping centers, and they were all networked on the telephone system. And then you got involved with one building in Manhattan, this uh, first apartment building. Yeah, that was, I, had, I had a partner who was in the real estate business, Jules Byron, who I think you know. And I was in a small town, Port Washington. Everybody knew I sold my business. He was in the real estate business. He called me up and said, Bert, can we meet? I said, sure, Jules. I kind of knew him peripherally. He was on the block. I said, Bert, I have an opportunity. If you put up $650,000, we could buy this building on 72nd Street and Columbus Avenue. It, right now, it, it's a, a, an apartment house. We can convert it and co-op it and make money. So I understood what he was saying. I put up the $650,000 above a million two mortgage, underlying mortgage. And then my six fifty dollars became a million three. Then we sold the... Uh, retail for a million two. Then we sold the unsold shares for a million. And I remember telling him, Jules, it's, it's kind of like stealing. I didn't do anything. He said, no, the lawyers and the brokers did everything. I said, you make this kind of money and don't have to work yeah, for but it? But this later on, you know, because I, I, you know, there's a lot for me to do in 10 more minutes. But I mean, you got into the, uh, health, the screening business. Tell me about the, the so We were screen. in the home care business. New York State passed a law that every home care worker must be screened for communicable diseases, high blood pressure, TB. Well, the agencies were complaining to us. We were doing the billing. You can't bill the state unless those home care workers were screened. So they complained to me. They couldn't get the doctors to do it. So I said, you know what? That's not a bad business because I know all the home care workers already. We're doing their payroll and the billing to the state. So I opened up a company called Mobile Health. And at first, we got a a mobile van. And we went from location to location because we didn't have enough business. Today we have six offices in the boroughs in Nassau County. We do 160,000 screenings a year and now we do background checks, we do um, uh, the screenings, we do wellness programs. Mobile health became a business in itself. Now growing up in the Bronx where you were, I don't think you had the opportunity to go down to Florida. How did you end up in Florida in the real estate business and Everybody, I mean, I, I, I didn't go to Florida much, but everybody remembered Wolfie's. Wolfie's was an institution. So let's talk about that. Because I'm a serial entrepreneur, <clears throat> if you come to me with an idea, and I think it's a good idea, I'm all for it. 
So someone comes to me, they want to build a garage in South Beach. Well, everybody complains about the parking. So they went and found the land. I put up the money. We built a garage, and it was enormously successful. Well, then they said to me, you know what? We have an opportunity of assembling the rest of the block. But the key piece was a corner on 21st Street and Collins Avenue, which was occupied by Wolfie's. And the owner of Wolfie's died, and the son just wanted to sell it. So we assembled the entire block. Did you get the rolls before? No, we didn't get the rolls. We get anything. We did, it was we did we did have to keep, by the way, the wall that's on the corner of 21st and Collins. We had to keep. We could not take that wall down. The rest of the building we took down. We increased the garage to 440 parking spots, built 40,000 feet of retail space, 52 apartments, and we're uh, in the heat, in the middle of South Beach now on 20th and Collins. Everybody remembers the Great Gatsby, F. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Tell me about that. That 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 is, was a, is a fun project, although it's very expensive. About ten years ago, it was put on the market by the Payson family for fifty million dollars. It's in Sands Point, a community where I live for over forty years. Um, I looked at it. It was, it was a great house, but fifty million dollars was. I didn't think it was worth it. When I was able to buy it for $17.5 million, my first thought was I would live in the big house with my wife, and I have four children, all adult children married. They, so you make it the Brusky compound. Exactly. It's, it, it's, it was zoned for five lots, and I would have five houses. The problem is my wife didn't want to live in a 21,000-foot house in this stage of our lives. Each of my children, who, who three of them already live in Sands Point, they like living in the same village, but they don't want to live on the same block. So they didn't like the idea. My little one, who Lee, who lives on 53rd and 2nd, is not ready to move to the island. So I decided to d develop it. So I filed. But you knocked the building down. Well, you knocked this, the, the, this legendary building down. First, I had to go get my demolition permit, which was not easy. So I get my demolition permit, and every newspaper picks up this demolition permit. Every wire service... Uh, NBC, CBS, The Osgood Show, everybody. Why am I knocking it down? We could not find anybody who wanted to live on a 21,000-foot house on 16 acres. Nobody wanted it. It wasn't even the economics. You know, nobody wanted it. It just, it was, it is gorgeous. And as I tell people, times have changed. You know, when, when it was built uh, and is represented the, as Gatsby House, it was terrific at the time. Times have changed. People don't want to live in 21,000-foot houses. Remember, they had 12 in help on the third floor. Nobody paid income taxes. They had their own gas station, their own eight-car garage. They had apartments above the garage. And eventually, you're going to build f five houses. Over. Five gorgeous houses. I took Gatsby-type houses, but in today's environment. Five minutes left. I, I, I want to bring out a number of other points. Uh, you got involved in the uh, venture capital business. Somebody came to me because they knew I had sold my business and said, would I be a partner in a private equity business just in healthcare? Now, my whole career has been healthcare. So I met with uh, Harold Blue, who became my partner, and six and a half years ago, we started a private equity fund um, that now is, we're exiting, and whoever invests in that fund will get th uh, three times their money. They'll get an IRR of about, 30%, 29%. And we just started the second fund called Bell Health. And uh, everybody's jumping in now because now they want to know, why didn't I ask him to join the first fund? Now, let's also talk about giving back because one thing, you got involved with many charities, the Alzheimer's and other things and the Kabad and the, the Guru in House. But I think the ones that really relate, especially since we're on the City University network is is the fact that you decided a number of years ago uh to to fund five scholarships five scholarships a year five scholarships a year you can go from bronx science to city college for free five students a year and uh that was done in honor of my guidance counselor at bronx science then you did something in honor of the dean, dean. who 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 let you continue on i endowed a chair in his honor because he let me stay at City College. Was he alive when you and No, he wasn't. He wasn't. My guidance counselor in high school was. 
And he, I speak to him occasionally. You know, he's very proud. He says he remembers I did belong at science, he right. said. Right. And then this year, the kid from the Bronx got an honorary degree. Total surprise. It was an honorary doctorate. And it was interesting because in my speech, which I kind of stressed over, I didn't know what to say, I told the students that uh, all the people I help at Alzheimer's should thank City College. All those that go in the nursing home should help City College. And Linda should help, the assisted living. They should remember that they have to help the people that come after them. Because I couldn't have gone to college. You've been married to Miro for 44 years. 44 years. And you have four children. Let's go over the four children. Okay. David is my oldest. He is our uh, design person. He's very creative, very good at what he does. Um, married to Kim. And uh, he has two daughters. He has uh, Drew and Ryan. Then uh, uh, Jeffrey, who is, manages the family real estate, is married to Karina, and he has Kayla, and he has uh, Ashley. Then I have Jessica, who's a mother and a housewife, married to Craig, who's in the furniture business, not involved with us. And they have uh, Dylan, uh, Avery, and Reese, who's, uh, I take credit for Reese, I push for the third for them. And, and, and then I have Lee, who's my youngest, who uh, works, as you know, for Newmark. And um, he's in the real estate business. He's married to Rebecca, who's a real estate lawyer. So in one of the articles, you know, we were saying there were three words that really personifies you. What, do you, what were those three words? Well, I, I try to remember early. Passion was one, persistence is the other. I said aggressiveness, but uh, I think you said I had a different word for it the first time we spoke. Right, but I think it's aggressiveness, and, and, and I think that there's no question the tenacity, but, you know, for the kid from the Bronx who started with nothing, uh, fortunately, who has done well, but you've done more important because, you, you know, the, the, the true meaning of tzedakah is to giving back, and you, you continue to give back. My, my mother once said to me, you'll know you were a success when, when you go on, that the world was a better place that you were here. But I have to tell you one quick story, if I can. I became friendly with Colin Powell, and um, he gave me an award at City College. And people often ask, did I think I could aspire to where I've, this position I've attained? And I said, I didn't because I didn't know this position existed in the world. I, I didn't, you know, I came from this small shtetl in the Bronx. So I didn't know this world existed. But it's funny because Colin Powell said to me, Bert, people asked me in the Bronx, because where he grew up, the same question. Colin, do you think you'd be like Secretary of State or National Security? Right. He didn't know that existed either. Bert, I'd like to thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Goldman Properties, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, 
Triangle Equities, the Wickoff Group, Urban American.